thank you, God. Good morning, PT. Good morning, PT Global. Good morning, family. It's an honor and a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Merry Christmas. Wherever you are, just say Merry Christmas. If there's someone next to you, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, family. Merry Christmas, family. <laughs> Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is with us, and we are ready to worship our King. Hallelujah. All right, family. Let's sing some Christmas songs together. Amen. Amen. Hark the herald, angels sing, glory to the newborn king. We come to give you glory, O God.
right where you are, can you just kneel before the King? We're just gonna take one minute to just kneel before our King. from the admin team. We make it easy to serve. Hello, Pentecostal Tabernacle. The Office of Pastoral Services wants to wish you a Merry Christmas and a prosperous New Year. Remember, we're here for you. Merry Christmas, PT, from the Office of Operations. Oh, 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 oh. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. God bless you on this Christmas morning. Why don't you take a few moments to just to wish people online Merry Christmas. Just type it up, Merry Christmas. Put a Christmas tree, put Jesus, whatever you want to do. But we are just grateful to be here together worshiping the Lord on Christmas morning. Well, our speaker this morning is one of my sons in the Lord. I really am grateful for what God is doing in his life. And I am just so um, blessed that he is going to be the speaker this morning. And that is our own uh, brother, Jeffrey Dion. I am just pleased to see how he has grown, not only his walk in the Lord, but also as a husband. And as he's about to minister this morning, um, I just want you to know that uh, the grace of God is on his life. I'm, from you who do not know, Jeff, he is also the director of the worship and arts and media ministry here at this church and has done a phenomenal job. And him and his team has done a wonderful job allowing us to worship together even during this pandemic. And so at this time, we want to get ready for the word of the Lord that's coming through the man of God, our brother Jeff. And so even right now in the chat, just say, God bless you, Jeff. And I'm praying for you, Jeff. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good morning, PT. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Merry Christmas to you and your family. I'm so excited to be here and share a word with you all. Before we do that, I just want to sing something. Y'all know I'm a worship leader, so I can't not sing something. Um, I know we just sang it, but I'm just going to sing it again. So come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Won't you sing that with me? Oh, come, oh, come, let us adore 
adore Oh, come let us adore Oh, come let us adore Him Oh, come let us adore Him Christ the Lord Hallelujah Let's give him all the glory. Let's give him all the glory. Let's give him all the glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I'm already sweating. Let's get into it. All right. Thank you, Tommy. All right. It's Christmas morning. Hallelujah. Let's, uh, you know, let's hop right into the word. Okay, so we are looking at Isaiah. We were looking at a couple scriptures this morning, but we're looking at Isaiah 7, verse 10 first. And it says, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Somebody say Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Amen. All right, so we're looking at, we're starting off at the first prophecy um, of the birth of a Savior that we see in the Bible, and it's, um, it comes to King Ahaz as he... Um, He's struggling to come to terms with God's promise to him that he would not let um, the attacks from Israel and Syria on Judah come to pass. And he just won't, he just doesn't believe the Lord. Um, you know, they've already had to sustain a bunch of calamity and devastation. And at this point, Ahaz is just not believing God. Um, so much so that um, instead of reacting to God's promise, they react to with fear um, instead of with trust in God. Um, it has literally says in verse 12, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. You ever get so bad you don't even want to ask God for a sign? It got really bad. It was almost as though it got so bad that uh, Ahaz was like, well, if if God loves me, why did he let all this stuff happen to us? If God cares, if God worries about this at all, if he was going to do something, why are we in this mess at all? How am I supposed to trust him now after all that he has allowed to happen? And we see that um, as a result of that, even though he says, no, he's not going to ask the Lord, he's not going to tempt the Lord, Israel gives... Uh, Isaiah gives him the, the prophecy anyways, and he says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Ahaz's fear has caused him to not believe the word from God. So as I was reading this, I had to, you know, it's PT, so we got to do... You know, we're a word church. We're a big word church. So I looked up the word believe. Um, and there's two definitions, and both of them were interesting to me. One, one was an acceptance that a statement is true or that something exists. And the second one was trust, faith, or confidence in someone or something. So in order to believe something, you must accept it as true have faith in it, trust in it, and be confident in it. In other words, you, you have to accept it as being real. 
So maybe you believe in, uh, I don't know, ghosts. That's weird, but you accept, the, we, you accept ghosts as being true and they're real to you. And maybe you claim to, to have seen one. For me, uh, I believe the, this is, if you're a transplant, you might not like this one, but too bad. I believe that the 2001, 2020 Patriots are the greatest sports dynasty of all time. I just, I just think, thank you. I just think that's just how it is. I, like when they stepped on to the field, you could not tell me that they weren't gonna win. It didn't matter who they were up against, who was on the team, do I know who this person is or not. When they stepped on the field, I just believed, I accepted as true, and I, Honestly, in my heart of hearts, believed that they were going to win every single time. So that was my belief. I believed that they could not lose. Even when they lost, if you're a Patriots fan, you probably still talk smack. Even when you lose, we don't even win. We don't even lose well, okay? That's how much we won. Okay, so that's what I believe. Well, have you ever spoken to someone um, and they didn't believe the, sa the same thing that you believed? So... Uh, Maybe you're not a Patriots fan. Maybe you're just another team's fan. So you probably don't believe that they're the greatest sports dynasty of all time. That's your business. Uh, so uh, when I was in college, um, I'm, giving, I'm giving you a story about me interacting with someone who didn't believe something I had to say. But when I was in college, um, sophomore year, um, it's Friday night, and um, I lived with three guys at the time one of them, we shared a room together. It was two rooms, so, we, so one of them shared a room, with, a room with me. It's Friday night, and in the winter, I really, like, I just, I don't really like to go out or do anything, <laughs> really. It's dark, it's cold, it's not fun. And so the guys are getting ready to go, to go do their thing, um, and I was like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna hang back. So I'm, like, blasting gospel music in the, in, the, in the house, and I'm, like, I'm doing laundry, I think it was, and my roommate walks in, and he was like, what are you, uh, what you, what you listening to there? And I was like, gospel music. He was like, oh, okay, cool, sure. So I, don't, I didn't really play gospel music in the house for that reason. I wasn't trying to hear all that. Um, but I'm just, you know, y'all are going out, so I have the house to myself. I can play my music, okay? I'm doing my laundry, playing my music. And he's like, so you're really about this, like, Jesus thing, huh? I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, um, why did you ask? And so he shares with me um, his skepticism, I, I guess. I didn't ask at all. <laughs> Did not ask. But he shares it with me. Um, and so he shares a story with me about how when he was a small child, very, very, very young, um, it was him and his mom and his dad. And um, he, his father falls ill. Um, he comes down with... Uh, um, some mental issues, some mental illnesses, and ends up being institutionalized. Um, and so while he's institutionalized, you know, people are calling the house, coming by, dropping flowers, all these things, saying my thoughts and my prayers are with you. And for him, he was like, that's weird. I, I guess if everyone's praying, I, f I should probably pray too. So he gets on his knees and he prays this prayer. And he says, God, if you are real, heal my father. If you are real, heal my father. His father didn't get healed. His father actually, I think, is still um, in, in the institution that he was, who he was back then. And so as a result of that, he um, takes on the belief that either God is not real or he doesn't care about me. Um, so if you ask him that, he'll say he's agnostic because he's like, I don't want to say nothing's happening, but I don't really think something's happening. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any evidence of it. And so um, he doesn't believe in God. He's never experienced God's truth or God's reality in his life. What's terrible is that I didn't have an answer. I mean, I wasn't ready for him to, I thought he was <laughs> just coming into the room to grab something. Didn't expect that. Um, I, just, I just looked at him dumbfounded. Um, 
I didn't know the story about his father. I said, I'm sorry. And that was it. And um, we'll come back to that, but I just wanted to put that bookmark there. So let's stick with me. Let's fast forward 600 years from that first scripture. And so now we're at Matthew 1, verse 18. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. I'm reading the King James Version. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, um, espoused just means he was betrothed, which is sort of like, it's like an engagement on steroids. It's like an engagement, but to break it, you have to get a divorce. So it's pretty, pretty serious. Um, before they came together, she was found with, the, with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being just man, being a just man, sorry, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Gotta love King Jimmy. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And so we see here that uh, initially Joseph didn't really believe Mary, right? Because he says he's going to take her away privily. He's a good man. The Bible says he's a just man, so he didn't want to embarrass her publicly or make an example of her, so he's going to be like, listen. Let's just, let's just call it here, right? And we could say that's reasonable, right? That's, I didn't get you pregnant. And now you're talking about it's God's kid, which is like, a, what? <laughs> but when the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, he said, do not fear. Is it harder to believe in something when you're afraid or when you're scared? My first thought was, how do you react in a situation like this where you have to believe God, but all you feel is fear or disbelief or doubt? How do you, how do you stay in the reality of your belief in God? Joseph chose to, to believe the report of the angel of the Lord, that indeed Mary was pregnant with the Son of God, and he was coming to save the world from sin. Can you imagine what it's, can you imagine what it must be like to have a fiance? It's probably important to you that your kids together are yours, right? Or can you imagine being a teenage girl who has to tell her fiance that she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Like, the Bible says the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. It wasn't anything crazy, like, but she's with the Son of God. And the Bible says he called, that the angel said to call him Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. God with us. God with us. What does that even mean, God with us? Well, um, with means accompany. I had to look this up. I actually looked this up this morning because I was like, I, I keep saying God with us all day. What does that word mean? With, with means accompany, and accompany means uh, to be present at the very same time. God had to be with Joseph during this entire thing. Can you, can you, just, can you imagine what it must have been like to protect and defend the mother of a child that is not earthly yours? but it's yours to protect and look after. God had to look after and be with Mary as she became pregnant, not by her own will, but by the will of the Holy Spirit, even though she was willing. 
This teenage girl had to be open to ridicule. People thinking they know her business. Talking about what's going on in that house. Can you imagine? And it says God with us. God had to be even with the child. Yes, it's Jesus. But he sent his kid to this earth to be looked after by two teenagers who knew they had to go to Nazarene because of the census. Nazareth, sorry, because of the census and didn't make arrangements for where to go. Some of y'all won't even let, drop your kids off at the nursery, okay? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that must be like? Raising a kid they had in a manger. All I could think of was I wish, I wish I, I, wish I had t said these things to my roommate when he told me the story that God was with him, that God never left his side. God was present at the very same time he made that prayer, even when he was this small. That God was ver his very present help in his time of need, that he could lean on God. That just because bad things happen, those are not a result of an absent or blind, deaf or even non-existent God. I wish I could have told him that he could lean on the Lord for his strength. Throughout his life of dealing with the absence of his father and what that meant. I wish I could have told him that he had a father in God. God with us. I wish I, could, I wish I could have told him that God's name means God with us. He is with you and that his name is his promise. His promise is his name and his name is Emmanuel. And he is with you. So how is God with us? From his very incarnation, from the moment this angel came to Joseph, but even 600 years prior to that, from the moment Isaiah said those words to Ahaz, God was with us. God with us. The, how else do we see God being with us in the anointing and the influences of the Holy Spirit? When we hear the Lord speak, when we pray in our private time, when we hear teachings and preachings of the word, God is with us. Through every action of our life, um, where we begin, where we end, God is with us. He's never leaving you. He's never forsaken you. God is with us. In his name, he is with you. He is, he literally embodies God with us in his birth to comfort us, to enlighten us. He came to save the world. God is with us to protect us and defend us in every time of temptation, in every trial, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment. God is with you. He's, he lives through us. He's for you. He's not against you. I have one more story for you. So um, I struggled um, in 2017 and 2018. Um, I got married in 2018, but in 2017, I... Uh, moved out of my mom's house um, so I could try to do this life thing by myself first for a little bit at least before I proposed and got married. So um, before I moved out, God had already told me that um, Isabel was going to be my wife. And so I had already purchased a ring. Um, I did not expect, however, <laughs> that like... A week after moving out, that he would tell me to propose like this month. <laughs> like I, I just moved into my apartment. I don't have a job. <laughs> I just graduated like six months prior. And God's like, go propose to Isabel. Make it happen. So I stepped out on faith and I proposed and she said yes. Woo! Um, and then. And then it just like went downhill. Not my relationship, but like life. Could not find a job. I ran out of money. Um, I hit the worst depression of my life. I mean, from like December 2017 to well, like April 2018, I was stuck. I mean, I felt like God had abandoned me. That, that was the first time I think that I could remember feeling 
alone. I felt helpless and small. It wasn't in my plans to propose to my girlfriend three weeks into <laughs> moving into a new apartment. If you've ever moved, you know it's not just one month's rent, so that's a lot of money to, that's gone all at once. Every, every time I turned, my mind was fighting me and I couldn't shake it. Also, like, I didn't understand how I couldn't get hired. I was like, I am qualified. I've done stuff. I've, I have my name in a couple movies. I've done some sports broadcasts. Like, I should, have, I should get a job. And I love Jesus. Why am I not employed? But when I tell you that Emmanuel was with me, do you know that I never, at no point did I have more than like $150 in my bank account for those four months, five months. I never missed a meal. My rent was always, always paid. A couple times it was late, but it was paid. God never left my side. He even got me the job that set me up to do the job I'm doing today. I never expected to work at Harvard University doing nothing that I went to school for. <laughs> But he never left me. He never forsaked me. I even got married. I got married and I had a job. Now, I'm saying that because I do remember at one point, it got so bad that Isabel was like, so, <laughs> we're getting married soon. And I do not plan on paying bills by myself. And I was like, you heard her? <laughs> and so my encouragement to you today is that God is with you through every storm, through every situation. This Christmas, I want you to take that with you, that God is with you, no matter what it's looking like, no matter what's going on right now, God is still the promise keeper. He is still with you. It's in his name. Do you believe, Emmanuel? Do you believe that Jesus is with you? Do you accept that he has ne will never leave you, that even when it looks terrible, even when bad things are happening, because they will happen, they will happen, Accepting Jesus as your Savior does not mean it's a free ticket. Ask any person who loves the Lord. It doesn't get easier. If anything, it might get a little harder before it gets better. But the whole time, you have him to lean on. You have him to be your strength, to be your backbone. Do you have faith that Jesus is the Savior and that he will never leave you? Are you confident enough in him to lean on his promise? You know, like I said earlier, even, even Emmanuel had to believe that God was with him. Even Jesus needed to believe that. Isaiah 53, verse 1, says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid it as were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of peace, of our peace, was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. If Emmanuel, if Jesus himself needed God to be with him, even as he's on the cross and he's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If Jesus who came to earth to carry our sorrows and bear our griefs needed God to be with him, who do we think we are that we might not need him to be with us. Who do we think we are that he wouldn't be with his own children? The Bible says, um, he shall grow up as a root out of a dry ground. He came from Nazareth, as I said earlier. Nazareth was dry ground. So there was no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected. Listen, if you need 
If, if you don't believe that God understands what you're going through, I'm here to tell you that you are wrong. He understands what it means to be rejected. He understands what it means to be despised. He understands what it means to feel ignored, to feel like no one is there, to feel helpless. He understands sorrow. He, he's acquainted. These are not good nicknames. These are not great things to have. Like, I don't want anyone to call me a man of sorrow. I don't want anyone to call me acquainted with grief, with grief. But he bore that so that we might be set free. So that we would understand that as a result of his sacrifice, as a result, excuse me, of his coming down to this earth, wearing flesh just to free us from our sins, we might understand the truth, the reality of who he is. And so this Christmas, I ask you, what will you believe? Will you believe your situation? Will you believe what your eyes are telling you? Will you believe what things look like when you look at them? Or will you believe that no matter what happens, no matter what comes my way, I know that God is still with us. I know that God is with me. I know that he won't leave me. I know that he won't forsake me. If I, could, if I could tell my roommate, if I could have that whole conversation one more time, that's what I would tell him. Just because bad things happen does not mean that he's not real, does not mean that he's not there. He understands bad things better than anyone. And that's why he's our comforter. That's why he's our strength. And so I encourage you this morning, as you go to open those gifts, as you are around family or around whomever you're around, that you would be encouraged that God is with us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much, Brother Jeffrey, for allowing the Lord to use you. I started off... Uh, beginning uh, my introduction to uh, Jeff being the speaker with the words Merry Christmas. And yet for some of you, maybe many of you, today is not a Merry Christmas. Um, today when maybe you yourself are a person of sorrows, a lost job or uh, lost living arrangements or the pain of having lost a loved one this year. And Christmas simply intensifies that grief. And of course now, uh, we are now into our second winter of this third strain of the coronavirus. And it's a season that's not merry, but it's a season that is full of anxiety. And I'll be honest with you, I myself have been sensing that anxiety where I, I literally sometimes had to calm myself down and realize that God is with me. This is a tough season that we're in and a tougher season that we're going to enter. But the good news is that, as we heard last Sunday from our brother Troy Van Voris, God is good. Can you say that with me? God is good. Type it in the chat. God is good. And now, the attachment or the part two of God is good today is not only is he good, but God is with us. God is with me. I want to give you the opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior. He has given the gift of himself during this season called Christmas. 
And there's nothing worse than giving a gift and that gift not being received. So as your eyes are closed and your head is bowed, this is an opportunity for you to receive Jesus Christ, God's greatest gift. And if you're here right now, never receive Jesus Christ as your savior, and you say, you know what? I want God, T times are gonna be tough anyways, so I might as well have the tough times with God being with me. And so if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, just repeat after me. Dear Lord, I come to you right now, and I admit that I'm a sinner. But I also know that you sent Jesus as your gift to bring me eternal life. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. And so Jesus, now that I know that God raised you from the dead, I am asking you, come into my heart, take away my sin, and make me a child of God. Jesus, thank you for being God's gift to my heart. Amen. Well, if you receive Jesus as your Savior, if you receive God's gift, I'm going to ask you to put it in the chats that, hey, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, and somebody will contact you and give you our, our address. You can write ptspice.org or mail at ptspice.org to let us know that you receive God's greatest gift, Jesus Christ, and we will get in touch with you to send you information to encourage you so that you will know that you don't have to be alone. God is with you, and so aren't we. God bless you. And just before I give the benediction or the blessing in this church, we don't give a closing prayer. We give a closing blessing, and I want to give you a closing blessing right now. But before I do, I want to encourage you uh, to give Jesus it's his birthday. Give him a Christmas gift. As you know, we have been in the process of our goal is to raise $350,000 this month in order to, number one, we're that close to paying off the mortgage of this church, which will be amazing. In eight years, we will be able to pay off this entire uh, mortgage so that we'll be debt-free. And then secondly, we will be going moving forward in uh, remodeling and renovating our basement, beginning of it anyways, so that we can have a place to be a blessing, uh, particularly and primarily to, for our children and our youth and young adults. So God bless you, you can uh, give it with the information that you see on our website or on the chat. God bless you and let me close out with this closing blessing. Put out your hands. This is Christmas, the celebration of Christ, and I want to give you the gift of a blessing that is found in the book of Numbers, in the Bible, Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26, and it says this, may the Lord bless you and protect you, may he look after you, shield you, defend you, and take care of you. May the Lord make his face to shine, grin, and beam, and show his pleasure to you. May the Lord be gracious, kind-hearted, pleasant, and compassionate to you. May the Lord show you his favor that will promote you, appreciate you, support you, side with you as you side with him. And finally, may the Lord give you his shalom, his peace, his rest, his harmony, his calmness, oh Lord, especially in this season, his calmness, his composure, his prosperity, and his success. And may the Lord remove from you especially this day, anything that causes agitation or discord with his divine destiny and purpose for your life. I bless you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody say and type in that chat, like, I receive that blessing. God bless you and have a wonderful day of celebration this Christmas before the Lord. And remember, God is with you.